I'm just going to welcome Graham Harmon to get us started and to waste no more time. I don't know if the microphone is necessary, but I tend to like microphones. Is that too long? It's good. It's fine. Yeah, I like this cyborg, letting a man and machine concept of carrying my voice magnified. Um, thanks to Ian and to everyone else who helped organize this conference. And it's an interesting experience for me because this is my first time back in my home country, the United States, in over three years. And so the experience of foreignness is also further magnified by the fact that I've never been in Atlanta before. I just arrived uh, the day before yesterday, I guess. All right, so Ian uh, already said so many things I wanted to say in the introduction, but the term object-oriented philosophy was one that I coined in 1999 to give a conference paper near London. And I stole the metaphor from computer programming, obviously, but it was not inspired by it. I don't know it well enough to claim that there's a parallel or a lack of parallels. Uh, I simply stole the, the title, and I'll leave it to those of you who are greater experts in, in the computer field to decide what the similarities and differences are. And uh, I believe Levi Bryant is the one who coined object Dorian ontology. We like the triple O look, and it was last year, wasn't it? You, ooh, yeah, so it's, it's now ooh. And by the end of this lecture, I hope you'll have some idea of what we're doing, and I'm also gonna give a little bit of historical background Okay, the first thing I'm going to do is give some, some stories, some easy stories to show how this kind of philosophy develops. Then I will go back through the history of philosophy and give some points of orientation for how what we are doing is the same as and different from some fairly famous philosophers from the past. And then at the end, I want to give a little bit of a taste of some of the systematic problems that are connected with this philosophy that maybe aren't solved yet or maybe in the process of being solved. And as, Levi, uh, as Ian put it last night, let you see the labyrinth and maybe not get too far in. I'd say that you can read some of our forthcoming books, if you're interested in the details. Okay, now onto the title here. The title here is, is part facetious and part misleading. I like titles like that. The facetious part is that versus implies that I'm going to attack Austrian objects. I'm not. I love this group of Austrian philosophers from the late 1800s, early 1900s, who were also philosophers of objects. The versus simply implies that I'm going to talk about the differences. Because sometimes people ask, you know, hasn't this already been, been done by this or that philosopher? Yes and no. There are some points of similarity, but there are some things that they didn't do that I would like to see done. And the misleading aspect of the title is that uh, the Austrians are only going to be one part of a presentation that has to do with many figures from the history of philosophy, but you'll get a sufficient taste of them, I think. Okay, so to start off with where this came from, oh, I should have shown you this Betsy Ross flag and the Habsburg flag. <laughs> I love Google. Here's spectator videos. I picked our funniest. I didn't create this. This is some joker on the internet to put our faces on. I don't even know what band that really is, if it's Def Leppard or one of these heavy metal scorpions. I don't know who it is. But they superimposed our faces there on the band. Speculative Realism was a group uh, founded in 2000. Our first event was in 2007. It was actually founded in 2006. And Ray Brassier, who's second from the right there, deserves most of the credit. It was his idea to bring together the four of us. Why the four of us? Well, Continental philosophy, meaning the sort of philosophy that is descending, descending from the great German and French tradition of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, uh, has focused largely on the relation between humans and the world, the single relations gap between humans and the world. Can we cross it? Can we get knowledge of what's outside of us? Uh, is there no gap to begin with? Uh, are we always already attached to the world? Or are we separate from the world? But philosophy has dealt too much with this single gap, or a single lack of gap between humans and worlds. Has had nothing to say about the relation between parts of the animal reality. Uh, that's been left to the natural sciences. If so, let the sciences deal with that. Philosophy will be the, the type of knowledge that deals with the human relation to the world. And of course, not even that is under attack by cognitive science. So philosophy is left with nothing when that happens. What uh, united all of us, all the four of us, despite our big differences, is that all four of us were trying to challenge this notion, which the book Kantan Su here. It was really Su's book, published in early 2006, that triggered the formation of the group. He's a young French philosopher working at the École de Massé I believe that's from a German television interview with him, but still. He wrote a book called After Finitude, which is now available in English. And he coined a term that was very valuable for us, which really is what unites us, the critique of correlationism. Correlationism, they have subject and object, they're always together. Um, this has been characteristic of most philosophy, at least in the continental tradition, since Kant, who published the Critique of Pure Reason in 1781. 
And Mayasu uh, pointed out that too many philosophies are dependent on this idea that everything revolves around the relation of human and world. And he pointed out some of the problems with this in his book and suggested a way forwards. Now, none of us agree on how to do that. If I could summarize brief, briefly uh, what the reaction of each of the four of us is to this, this, this predicament, Mayasu thinks there's no escaping this correlate. Mayasu thinks that if you want to say um, there's something outside of thinking, that itself is a thought. And so then you're trapped back inside the circle of thinking. Mayasu's position is essentially the heir of the German idealist position. That if you want to think an unthought tree, well, it's actually a thought tree because you're, you're just thinking about the unthought tree. And so there's really no such thing as the, you can't have the things in themselves as well. So you can't have these unknowable things in themselves that are outside of human categories. Uh, the German idealists can be said to have simply cut those off. And so we're somehow within the circle of thoughts. Mayasu thinks, though, that we can radicalize that and turn it into absolute knowledge so that it's no longer a skeptical position. And in this respect, he is not that different in his assumptions from Bavio and Zizek, who are already well known figures. Brassier, Ray Brassier's approach to the problem is to move off more in the direction of the natural sciences. Uh, Brassier thinks objective knowledge of the world is possible. It, he complains that philosophy has turned into transcendental sociology, as he calls it, and needs to gain some kind of contact with the real world again. In the case of Ian Hamilton Grant, who teaches in Bristol, his approach to getting out of correlationism was to say that there is a real outside of what is known, but unlike in my position, where it's a real made up of individual objects, for him it's a it's something more unified, it's a productive force. And there's this unified productive force that meets with obstructions and what he calls retardations and turns into individual objects secondarily. And then my position will be covered in the rest of the lecture. But there are four very different ways of dealing with correlationism, and what you're going to hear today is one. And the original group of four has fragmented somewhat, and we're all going off in our separate directions. And now I have my new allies here today. Okay. I think I may have forgotten. No, I'll leave it here for a second. Why objects? What's so important about objects? Well, in many philosophies today, you will find objects being the butt of many jokes and the object of many attacks. Uh, and there are two basic ways in which this happens. Objects can be undermined. And I'll talk about the pre-Socratic philosophers in a few minutes. Undermining objects mean you say that objects are not fundamental. You, know, you see a chair, but it's actually made of atoms, or it's made of quarks. Um, you, you're looking for some deeper fundamental reality that explains what mid-sized objects really are. That they're nothing important, they're nothing autonomous. You're always going to something deeper. That's what I call the undermining position. And then I coined the term overmining, the opposite of undermining. And that is what you see more often in modern European philosophies, especially since Kant. Overmining means objects are these falsely deep ghosts that you're positing that are not necessary. Right? Because why say that there's something there called a chair that's an independent existing object? What's happening is I have a certain experience of a chair. It, it's present, uh, it presents itself to me in a certain way. Or maybe it's a construct of language or it manifests itself in perception somehow. Uh, there's nothing un hidden underneath that experience called a chair, according to the overmind position. But what both positions have in common is that both of them skip over objects. Objects are somewhere in the middle, and both positions jump from one side to the other while ignoring and belittling those objects that are in between the two extremes. And that's what I'm trying to oppose. Um, what is typical of object-oriented philosophy? One is that, of course, objects exist at all levels. You can't privilege tiny little microparticles and say that those are the real thing. You can say, I don't even know what a, a blini, what was it? Oh, yeah, you know, like, a, maybe like you eat uh, uh, caviar with. Okay, yeah. I don't eat caviar, so that explains it. Uh, <laughs> but that would be a real object, say, an army, a, a society, Georgia Tech. Any of these things potentially could be objects. It's not necessarily the case that anything you named is an object. You could name something you think of as an object, but it's actually a pseudo-object of some sort. But that's, that's a different question. The point is, being tiny, being eternal, being fundamental, these are not necessarily features that objects need to have in order to be objects. Objects have to be unified, I will say, to be, to be real objects. Objects have to ha uh, have a certain depth that is not exhausted by all the relations they come into. And those are the main features of objects. Objects also have, a, have to have certain qualities that belong to them. And I will explain in a few minutes why Heidegger leads me to say that objects have to be deeper than any of their relations to anything else, any of their effects on anything else, and so forth. But I also believe there are two different kinds of objects. 
There are real objects which we can draw from our human experience and withdraw from all other objects into a kind of hidden vacuum. And there's also a kind of object that I would call sensual objects, which are the ones we experience as we look around us, chairs and people and so forth, trees. Okay. Now I go to the Heidegger slide. Heidegger actually hated the word objects. He used it as a pejorative term. For Heidegger, object is what you get when you falsely reduce reality to some model, whether it be a scientific model or a conceptual model. And he even thinks technology reduces things to objects, things that can be manipulated. Um, object, uh, things that are reduced to a mere set of properties that can be exploited by humans for their own purposes. But although he hated the concept of objects, he is the one who led me to this position, and I'll tell you a bit why. First, there was Edmund Husserl, who was the founder of phenomenology. He's one of the Austrians. He's actually born in uh, Moravia, now in the Czech Republic, but he was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And Husserl thinks that the only way to save philosophy from the onslaught of the natural sciences, as a result of which philosophy was turning into experimental psychology, is to not invent theories about our experience. You know, if you hear a door slam, you hear a sound, don't say that the door slam is creating vibrations in the air and it's going to your, your, vibrate your ear drum and that goes through your nervous system to your brain. We have no direct access to that. Before we get to that point, we should be describing very minutely and very patiently exactly what we experience. And that is simply the sound of the door slamming. And if you're good at phenomenological description, you can find all kinds of subtleties in that. And that's the that's phenomenological method. Heidegger, who was a student of Husserl, tried to challenge this notion by saying, you know, for the most part, we, we don't experience things by perceiving them. Things are not primarily objects in consciousness, as Husserl said. Why not? Well, because what about the floor you're sitting on right now? Something you weren't thinking about, most likely, until I mentioned it. But you're, you're relying on it. You're taking it for granted. If the floor had collapsed, you would have fallen, you would have been injured or killed. What about your bodily organs? You probably weren't thinking about those and should have pain somewhere until I mentioned it. There again, you're relying on this silent network of withdrawn objects that you, you don't usually consciously access. And so consciousness is actually a very thin film on top of a very much deeper reality for Heidegger. And when do we notice these things? Usually we notice them when they break, according to Heidegger. Uh, the, the bus doesn't come, or your, your computer crashes, uh, you have a heart attack, whatever. Something happens that makes something usually reliable malfunction. Okay, now the way that usually is interpreted is that Heidegger is putting practice before theory. Right, to say that uh, before we can observe something theoretically or look at it explicitly, we're using it practically in some way that we don't consciously recognize. So it becomes a distinction between conscious and unconscious, according to that interpretation of Heidegger. It becomes a pragmatist reading of Heidegger. Heidegger is about, about our pragmatic activity rather than our theoretical awareness, according to this reading. And one of my first breakthroughs, I believe in the early 90s, was to see that that doesn't work. The reason it doesn't work is because human practice does not exhaust the being of the things any more than human theory does. If my looking at the chair fails to exhaust all the properties of the chair, and there are properties of the chair hidden in reserve that are not exhausted by what I see, well, sitting in the chair doesn't exhaust the chair anymore either, right? Because there could be certain smells in the chair that animals smell, there are certain electromagnetic vibrations coming off the chair that maybe no living creature can detect. The chair is going to be a lot more, not only than my theoretical relation to it or my perceptual relation to it, but also deeper than my practical relationship to it. And so uh, my first step was to see that it's actually it's something deeper than practice or theory. There's something in objects that cannot be exhausted by any kind of human access whatsoever. There's something that humans simply cannot get at. So it, turns, it started sounding a bit like Kant's thing in itself. All right, but there's another step, and this is the step that's still controversial. And even many people who are taking the turn toward objects these days are going to think this is crazy. It's going to take a few more years, I think, to persuade them. And that is that objects do this to each other, too. All right, objects, I will not necessarily go so far as to say they're conscious, although I actually do think they are in some rudimentary way, but I don't need to make that claim uh, at the moment. What happens, to use the classic Islamic philosophy example, when fire burns cotton? Well, cotton has all kinds of features that the fire are completely irrelevant to the fire. The fire simply burns the cotton. The fire doesn't care about the smell of the cotton or the exact color of it or where it was harvested from or the price for which it was purchased. Uh, any of these things can be said to be properties of the cotton, but the fire doesn't exhaust it any more than we do. The fire makes some kind of contact with the cotton because it burns it, right? And so there's a sense in which objects withdraw from each other as well, not just from us. 
And this was really the key move, because this move completely blew apart the correlationist standpoint for me. And this is even before I met Leah Suik. I call it the philosophy of access rather than correlation. The philosophy of access needs to be shattered by the fact that all objects relate to each other. And the, my relation to this microphone is no different in kind from the relation of a breeze to this microphone as the breeze blows through the room. Uh, mine may be more interesting. My relation to the microphone may be more colorful and more fascinating to talk about. But it's no different in kind from, from that so-called anonymous relation. And so everything's put on an equal footing. All relations between all kinds of entities. And that is then one of the problem with this is that if objects don't touch, if they withdraw from each other, how can they interact at all? I quickly saw this was a problem. And this led me back to the occasionalist philosophers. And I've got a slide coming up on that, so I'll be brief now. The occasionalist philosophers are the ones who believed, starting with the Iraqi Muslims of the Hasharite school in the 900s AD, that um, to give any kind of causal power to any entity other than God is blasphemous. And they, they based this on a certain passage in the Quran, and they have, they have a rather unorthodox reading of it. And, uh, that passage suggests that everything is done by God. Not only can individual entities not create anything, they can't even cause anything, according to this view, which is very extreme. Um, and then it later came into Europe in the 17th century through Descartes and Lagrange, Leibniz. I, I, Barclay, Barclay is a position like this too. You can find a bit of it in Whitehead now as well. Even Bertano had a little bit. It keeps cropping up from time to time. And for me, this is one of the central breakthroughs in the history of philosophy. But I'll leave that to the slide. I'm already I'm taking too long on the introductory slides. So maybe now you get the idea that Heidegger, for me, was important for being the one who, through tools, his analysis of tools, turns out not to be just an analysis of hammers and drills and hatchets. It turns out to be an analysis of all objects whatsoever. And he isn't just saying that we're practically using objects in an invisible way before they become conscious to us. He's, he's saying that there's something in an object deeper than any human access to them. And finally, that objects are mysteries even to each other, because they never fully make contact with each other. There's, there's some excess of an object beyond all of its relations. So this is an anti-relational philosophy, in a way, this object-oriented philosophy. And this becomes important because one of my great allies, Bruno Latour, is actually a totally relational philosopher, and this is the root of our disagreement. Um, okay. A little bit more Heidegger here. This is Bremen, December 1st, 1949. This is the Newtown Hall in Bremen, where he delivered a very bizarre masterpiece of a lecture called Insight into What Is. This was his first lecture after World War II. Of course, he had been denazified because of his too close ties to the Nazi party. And for the purposes of this lecture, he talked about a concept nobody really understood uh, at the time, or even until now, called the fourfold. So my next talk, we talk about the thing. He talks about Chuck. And when he analyzes this jug, he finds that it's made of four terms. Where's the microphone? This, this jug, um, he says that Plato, Aristotle, and all later thinkers have never really understood what a thing is. And so Heidegger is really saying this is one of the central problems of his entire philosophy. What is a thing? He doesn't like the word object. Object is a negative term for him. An object is, is what we reduce a thing to when we approach it in some false way or, or oversimplify it. Thing is a positive term for Heidegger, but it means the same as I mean by object. Plato, Aristotle, and all the later thinkers failed to think the essence of the thing. And so in a way, Heidegger is telling us that his concept of the thing is his real breakthrough in Western philosophy. And here's what it ends up as. It ends up as a fourfold structure, earth, sky, gods, and mortals. And one of the things I'm most proud of, although the Heidegger scholarship has not accepted this yet, I hope they will, I believe I was the first person to make sense of this weird concept in Heidegger's philosophy, which is sounds like pseudo-poetic gibberish, and many people have seen it that way, earth, sky, gods, and mortals. They think it's just terms drawn from Plutoman's poetry and brought into philosophy with no rigor whatsoever. I went back through Heidegger's entire career and tried to trace how this emerged, and the later slides will explain uh, how I interpret it. What time did I start? Just so I can pace myself. 20 past. 20 past. Okay, so I've got 40 minutes. Okay. So now I'm going to go to the history of philosophy part of the lecture, and this will build up once we get to the 20th century thing, as to what I think really needs to happen next in philosophy. You remember my talk a few minutes ago of undermining and overmining objects. Undermining is when you say objects are too shallow to be true, and you go underneath them. And overmining is when you say objects are too deep to be true, and you stay at the level of experience and don't posit anything beneath experience. The pre-Socratics are the classic underminers. You know, pre-Socratics don't believe in chairs and horses and things of this sort. The pre-Socratics believe the world is made of deeper physical elements. They're also the first natural scientists in the West, as well as being the first philosophers. It starts with Thales, who believed that the first principle of everything is water. And 
really that all the pre-Socratics fall into one of two groups. There's the one group that says the world is made out of some basic physical elements, and depending on which thinker you look at, it's either water, or air, or fire, or in the case of Empedocles, air, earth, fire, and water. He's the one who invented that set of four classic Greek elements. Air, earth, fire, and water mixed by love and hate. Brought together by love, separated by hate. All of these philosophers are ones who think there's some more primary physical element that everything is made of. Okay, there's another group, including such figures as Anaximander and I would say Parmenides, uh, who don't believe that any one physical element can be the root of everything. And you can see why they think this, because if the root of everything is water, how could there be fire, since it's the opposite of water? Wouldn't the water in which the fire is made quench the fire, and so on? So there has to be something even deeper than any of the physical elements. And this usually received the name of the Aperon, this boundless, unified, think of it as a kind of lump. Uh, in which everything passes away. And they simply disagree about whether it existed in the past has been destroyed, whether it will exist in the future after millions of years, which is what an examiner thought, or whether it exists now and our stupid senses are deceiving us into not realizing it, which is what Parmenides would have said. So those are really the two options, but they're both undermining options. Either the world is made of some deeper physical elements, or it's made of just some unified whole from which all the individual elements emerge. Plato, who... Uh, I'm increasingly thinking he is the greatest philosopher of all time. I was undecided between Plato and Aristotle for a long time, but I'm on a Plato kick more and more. And what's interesting about that is that Plato has been the major targets of communal philosophy for the past 120 years, starting with Nietzsche, uh, continued by Heidegger, continued by Derrida, and others. Platonism is, always, those, Platonism is always something to be avoided. No, I think it's something to be affirmed and made more extreme. Uh, they, Plato, Platonism is often looked at as privileging eternity and the ideal of the real and a hatred of the body and a hatred of pleasure and things of this sort. I, I don't think that's the point. The point is that uh, Socrates always makes one basic move in all the dialogues. And that is, whenever Socrates asks somebody to define something, the first thing they do is give examples. They define virtue, and then Nino will give ten examples of virtue. And Socrates will say, no, I need a definition. And then Nino will ask things like, is virtue teachable? And Socrates will say, how can I know if it's teachable before I know what virtue is? This, to me, is the key platonic insight, that we have access to a thing before we have access to its qualities. We somehow have some kind of immediate access to some deep thing that's beyond us. We can't quite specify it, and yet it's there, we know it's there, and the qualities come second. And that will become more and more important as this lecture proceeds. That's what I get from Plato. From Aristotle, uh, Aristotle, for Plato, what's hidden, though, are, are qualities. They're universal qualities. They're not individual things. Individual things do not play a very important role for Plato, because the realm of matter is the realm of decay and corruption. Uh, the realm where these, these perfect forms exist is beyond us. Uh, for Aristotle, however, <coughs> individual things are his will. The world is made of primary substances, which are individuals. He's also the first one to have a concept of substances that are not eternal, right? because for all the pre-Socratics, Water or fire or water or air and fire, these things were indestructible. That's why they were ultimate elements. For Aristotle, however, a, a horse can be a substance, but you can kill a horse. It's not eternal necessarily. Um, and so he brought individual things into philosophy in a way that Plato did not. He has very interesting definitions of substance. One of them is a substance is something that can have different qualities at different times. And I would say the same about objects. That if a thing is not made up of its qualities because a thing can change qualities. The same person can be happy and sad at different times, the same person can be sitting or standing at different times. What makes something real is being somehow deeper than all of its qualities. He also gave the fourfold structure of causation, which has some relation to the fourfold in Heidegger, uh, not, not a direct one, but an indirect one. For Aristotle, things have the efficient cause, the material cause, the final, and the formal cause. The material cause being whatever this is made of, plastic and stuffing, the um, Formal cause being its shape, the final cause being its purpose, and which one then is efficient. efficient cause being who made it. Yeah. Okay, now we're going into occasionalism, but the theme that fascinates me. And this, I'm afraid this Iraq map is not an authentic ancient map, this probably comes from CENTCOM or <laughs> somebody like that. It's more like a modern map. But uh, Basra is really where this movement started. It spread to Baghdad then. It started in the south, and it started from this. Rather uncompromising reading of one particular passage in the Quran that dealt with the Battle of Badr, where it was said in the Quran that you think you have cast these stones, but truly it is Allah who has cast these stones. So 
So in other words, it looks like a human is throwing them, but in fact there was a little odd way to have it. Now, some people say yes, but that was just meant for that specific battle, which is a special event in Islamic history. But their interpretation of this was no, everything, everything that happens is done directly by Allah. And this is their form of occasionalism. And it goes so far that they are willing to say that you know, it's Allah who's moving your hand if you commit a murder, and <coughs> too bad. Uh, Allah has the power to send a good man to hell for no reason whatsoever, to send an evil man to heaven for no reason whatsoever, to make two plus three equal five, to make the world flooded and not flooded at the same time, to make us sitting in Atlanta and also in Mecca simultaneously. Um, God is absolutely all powerful, God's will is all powerful. There are no limitations on what God can will, even things that seem contradictory. Now, I gave the fire and cotton example already, which is the key key one in the history of Islamic philosophy. It's one they like to talk about over and over. And what they would say is that fire does not burn cotton, God burns cotton. That's the original form of occasionalism. It's a theology. And I would recommend that now. I think there has to be a, a secular concept of uh, occasional causation. But I think this is, this is often viewed as a kind of amusing, dusty old insight that he easily gets laughed off in introductory philosophy classes. In fact, it's a, it's a real philosophical insight, because this is really the first time that things have been radically disconnected in philosophy from each other. For example, in Aristotle, he'll talk about causation, but causation isn't a problem for Aristotle. It's not a problem, how can fire burn cotton, or how can I push something and it moves? There's no problem for one thing to touch another for Aristotle. In this theory, there, there is, for the first time in philosophy, and I would go so far as to say this is the major contribution of Islamic philosophy to the West, because I would argue that occasionalism is at the roots of all modern philosophy in the West from Descartes onwards, and that's coming up here in a few minutes. Um, things are radically separate because they cannot touch. Fire cannot touch cotton. It looks like it does, but actually God is doing the touching, which many people don't take seriously. I think it should be taken seriously because of the fact that that radical separation between things has reasons in its favor. Um, occasionalism never really spread in, in the Christian world. Uh, early on in Europe. Um, and that might simply be that Islam has always left a little bit more room for this absolute all-powerful will of God. They're, they don't tend to worry quite as much over what does that do to free will? What does that do to you? What does that do to your freedom to make decisions? It wasn't, it wasn't always, for some of them it was a concern, but not as universally so as it would have been in Western philosophy. And I'm going to show now one person who comes at the very end of medieval philosophy, and that is Francisco Suarez, a very fascinating character. Spanish Jesuit, uh, nearly 50 years older than Descartes, who uh, spent most of his, the time of his career in Portugal. Suarez wrote a giant compendium of metaphysics called the Metaphysical Disputations. I don't know how anyone could have written a book this large. There's an encyclopedic account of all philosophical problems. He writes about occasionalism in his, in his book, and what he says, he, he attacks it. He says this can't be true. Um, he doesn't seem to know that it was an Islamic concept. He quotes St. Thomas Aquinas attacking occasionalists, but he even says St. Thomas Aquinas never cites the names of any individual thinkers of belief. So as far as doesn't seem to know who they are, even though he was a very widely read person. But yet, he comes very close to himself in an interesting way. Um, and that's because in the tradition before Suarez, a thing is a combination of form and matter. So I would be a human shape stamped into whatever this physical matter is. For Suarez, it's different. For Suarez, a thing is totally concrete. It's a total compo concrete composite. Uh, the form itself is already individualized. You don't have to put the form in matter to be individualized. And what that means is that you can't move the form. Right? The form is where it is. You can't take a thing and move it to a place and still have it be the same thing, which is all, another key occasionalist idea. Right? That a thing is totally attached to all of its properties. A thing, a thing is the sum of all its relations, of all its qualities. Um, you cannot take a thing and move it and have it be the same thing. So if I move from here over to here, I'm a different person all of a sudden. Because for occasionalists, for most of them, each instant of time is also disconnected from each other instant of time. You can't say there's a thing that's enduring. Uh, you can say that a thing looks similar to all the instants of time. Um, but Suarez says there are cases when properties seem to be free from their substance. And one example of that would be miracles, the holy sacraments. For example, when you talk about the Eucharist, and you talk about the accidents of wine, 
having some relation to Christ's blood. That's an example where the, it's no longer the accidents of wine anymore. Even though it seems to be wine, it's not. It's actually the blood. And, but since accidents must always be in a substance, the substance that they're part of is God. So God is directly intervening in that case. And the other famous example he gives is conception. Right? You cannot say that a mother and father create a child because that would be taking away from God's power to create new souls. You cannot let, you cannot let mortal humans create new souls, according to this standpoint. And so there is a sense in which, as far as this philosophy, the power of God is already creeping in. We're almost at Descartes. Um, Francis, I put up Francis Bacon, who is one of my unlikely heroes. A lot of people see Francis Bacon as simply somebody who praised the empirical sciences over everything else. Actually, Francis Bacon is a very interesting philosophy in which things are made of a combination of forms, and those forms are hidden inside the thing and they're compressed by circumstances. Um, so, for example, he tries to make a list, make up a list of everything he knows that's hot. And it's a funny list. He has the dung of animals, fire erupting from the cavities of mountains, etc., lightning. He's got a list of everything that's hot in the world. And he thinks there's the same shared form of heat in all these things. And what happens, sometimes things are not burning or they're not hot, it's because the heat form is, is hidden, it's withdrawn, it's compressed inside the thing. So he's got this idea of hidden qualities that I also like. Okay, Descartes. This is really when we get occasionalism coming into the West for the first time. For Descartes, there are three, subs three kinds of substance. There are minds, there's physical substance, and there's God. God is the only infinite substance. And we, how could mind and body communicate? There are different kinds of substance for Descartes. And God is needed. God is needed to move your body. And what's lacking in Descartes, it's all about a mind-body problem. There's not a body-body problem in Descartes. And that's because in some passages of his books, he seems to think the world is one gigantic body. There may be many different minds, but there seems to be one body in many passages of his work. Um, and so God is needed primarily for the mind-body relation. Because mind and body are two different substances. And in passing, I would say that for me, it's the opposite. For me, two, two substances of the same kind kind of touch, and two that are of different kind can always touch. More on that in a minute. But here's Malo Branche, the great Cartesian in France, who brought back the body body problem, which the Muslims already knew about. The body body occasional problem. How, how can one thing touch another without God's intervention? You can't, according to Malo Branche. Leibniz. Leibniz is a theory of monads. Monads are individual. They are simple, they are indestructible, they are eternal. You can think of them as souls. Physical, you know that physical objects are simply combinations of monads. And monads have no windows, importantly, for today's lecture. Monads have no windows for Leibniz. They cannot precede each other. Um, if two things smash together and seem to damage each other, this would simply be an appearance. What, what's really happening is that everything that will happen to a monad through its entire future lifetime is programmed into it in advance by God. Now, my position has often been called neo leibnizian because I also believe in these withdrawn hidden objects. Uh, but here, what are the differences? First of all, the monads for Leibniz are all at the bottom level of simplicity. Leibniz distinguishes between monads and what he calls aggregates. So he says a circle of men holding hands is not really a thing. It's a thing of the mind. It's a thing created by your mind. He says a diamond might be a real thing, but a pair of diamonds glued together is not a real thing. Which is always surprising because a diamond in itself really needs a lot of polishing and work to become a thing. But, um, so he thinks you get down to this very simple level where there's real things, and on top of that you have this level of mere aggregates that aren't as real. So a machine cannot be a real thing for Leibniz. A government cannot be a real thing for Leibniz. Whereas for me, it can. Also, for Leibniz, they're indestructible. A, a monad cannot be destroyed. God created them all at the beginning of time. Uh, before you were born, where was your monad? It was floating around in space somewhere. And it also was attached to a tiny body, according to Leibniz. Uh, and then incarnated that body was augmented after your birth. And then after you die, the, the, monad become, the body becomes smaller and smaller. The monad becomes free from it. He even speculates on what it's like to be a rock. What's it like to be a rock is like being a very dizzy person. You spin around in a circle 25 times and you become very confused. This is what it's like to be a, a stone. Okay, you can start speeding up in the historical spark for you. I put in Berkeley because Berkeley is the most anti object oriented philosopher I can imagine. I can't think of a philosopher who's more opposite of me on every issue than Berkeley, which is kind of why I like him. It makes him very exciting. 
Barclay says, and I wish I remember the exact quote, it's a strange prejudice of philosophers that things such as trees, mountains, rivers, so forth, uh, have existence outside the mind. It's a very strange prejudice, isn't it? Um, that's one thing that, about his philosophy that's the opposite of mind, the fact that there is no existence for things outside the mind. The other thing is that for him, objects are simply bundles of qualities. Right, the, the British empiricist doctrine was that they, you don't really hold an apple, right? You hold red, a uh, spherical, solid, red, sweet, shiny, juicy, cold, and then through the force of habit, you link these together and think that there's an underlying thing called an apple that unifies all those qualities. And I'm opposed to this as well, but it, it's, it's a central part of Barclay's philosophy and of Hume's. And the other reason I mentioned Hume is because I think Hume and Kant are occasionalists of the upside down variety. They're not occasionalists in the sense that they think that God is coming in and, and making everything happen, but they are occasionalists in the sense that instead of making God the only thing that is able to link things and causal relationships, it's the mind. And Hume's whole point is that we cannot prove that there's a causal relationship between any two things. We simply, uh, there's a customary conjunction between two things, and so we assume that every time we put our hand on a fire, it burns. Um, but I just see this as a humanized form of occasionalism. Instead of God linking everything, it's the human mind linking everything, the human habit linking everything, and Kant as well. Although Stephen Shapiro might say in his paper that I'm more Kantian than I think, because I also believe in hidden realities outside the human mind, the things in themselves. But Kant's Copernican revolution, which is that we cannot talk about the world where it really is, but only talk about the way that the mind shapes the world, this is the root of what Mason called correlationism. So Kant is really the root of what these speculative realists were fighting, although we all admire Kant as a great philosopher. Fichte, who noticed that there's a certain incoherence to the thing in itself in Kant, simply dispensed with it. And Fichte is someone very admired by Mason. If you want to think a thing that's unthought, it thereby becomes thought. And so there's no way to escape that circle. There's no way to go outside of it. Whatever you think is always going to be inside of thoughts, which I'm also opposed to, of course, but this is something Manson still agrees with, uh, as do, I would say, Zizek and Badiou. Uh, Badiou says being and thinking are the same. Zizek, when he talks about breaking out of this circle, is a very weak form of breaking out. He says that there's this real traumatic kernel. There's this real, somehow, that it doesn't ever really become articulated in any way, except insofar as it shocks us or surprises us. There's nothing about different parts of the world interacting without humans being there in those philosophers, whether it's Zizek, about you, or even Nassau. You probably all heard the old Chinese proverb about uh, when the wise man points at the moon, the fool looks at the finger. What I've said about correlationism is that correlationism is the position that says the moon is made of fingers. It's even more foolish. Because it's saying we can't ever really get any access to the moon in itself outside of it. The, the moon is nothing more than its accessibility to us. And so we're really trapped in our human encounter with the moon. There's no way to talk about a moon insofar as it exists outside of us. Uh, and I have two objections to this. Uh, one of them is that to say the tree in thought and the tree outside of thought, you're not saying the same thing in those two cases. Whereas the correlationists would say that you're saying the same thing. Because if you say the tree outside thoughts, that's a thought and you're converting, converting it back into a thought. But they, don't, they obviously don't mean the same thing. Obviously there's a way in which language can point outside of this, this closed circle. And the other thing is that uh, this seems to take Mino's side and Mino's paradox back in Plato's dialogue. And I think anytime you're taking Mino's side and Socrates, you're probably making the wrong turn on the road. What, what that is about in the dialogue Mino is that Mino repeats an old saying by the sophists that there's no point looking for anything, no point looking for any knowledge. Because if you already have the knowledge, you won't be looking for it. And if you don't have the knowledge, how will you know what it is when you find it? And so therefore, there's no point searching for any knowledge at all. It's the sophist justification for laziness and for the fact that you don't seek knowledge, you just seek ways of getting more power. And it seems to me that the correlationist standpoint is a version of this, right? That um, we already know everything we can know. We, we can't go outside of the world because we're already trapped in this circle of thoughts. There's no way to get outside of it. Okay. I'm going to start skipping a couple of slides, I think. Now, again, I'm going to go back to the first. Again, there are certain people who think they are trying to work past correlations and now that they're not. And I've been critical, for example, of Merleau-Ponty, who's a philosopher I actually like. 
But Merleau Ponty thinks he's making a big, he's a French phenomenologist from the 1940s, 1950s, who died young, uh, says that not only do we look at the world, the world looks back at us. Okay. Even assuming that he describes that well enough, why is it just a matter of the world and I looking at each other back and forth? What about the parts of the world looking at each other? You see, a lot of these philosophies that claim to be doing something new and claim to be getting beyond the subject-object splits are keeping it. They're simply trying to jazz it up in some way to make it seem different. But it's still the same two poles there. Um, another example is that in some recent French phenomenology like Marion, they say that, no, things aren't trapped inside the circle of thought because the world is given to us. It comes from outside. Okay, but again, why is it just a matter of us and the world? Why is it always this relationship between just these two poles? So that it's us being surprised by reality. Why not the different parts of reality uh, interacting with one another? And it's very surprising to me, in a way, that so much modern European philosophy has been based on this single assumption that they believe is unshakable. There's no way to get outside of the circle of thoughts. And it's my belief that once it falls, it will fall very hard. And I think we're pretty close to a tipping point. I think one of the reasons people avoid realism is because they assume that it's boring. They assume that uh, realism is going to clip the wings of speculative philosophy and it's going to be talking about boring, solid objects sitting in a room. But as I've already mentioned, objects are what withdraw from any relation. Objects become almost like ghosts. Objects are something very mysterious. They exist at all different levels and sizes. You know, what does it mean to say that Georgia Tech is an object apart from all of its effects on all other things? As I do believe, that's not boring at all. I mean, you might think it's wrong, but it's, it's quite fascinating, I think. So realism is not boring. And in a way, I think object-oriented ontology is nothing more than a non-boring realism. <laughs> Many kinds of realism have been born. OK, now let's go to some Austrians, as I promised. I'm going to start with Bolsano, who's one of the earliest. Um, they tend to be marginalized, except that people still read Rousseau, of course, because he's the big star in the group. And Bolsano believed in something called the proposition in itself, which is basically this, this is an attack on the idea that truth can be psychological. So that if you want to say something that, um, like let's say, let's say you went back to the year 1900, and in the year 1900 you're saying the fact that the fact is that its atoms contain neutrons. Neutrons were not discovered until the late 1920s, of course. Well, what was the status of that statement if you think of the year 1900? Well, nobody was thinking it because nobody knew what a neutron was. Nobody even suspected the existence of a neutron at that time. But some would say it had to have some truth value outside of any minds because no minds were conceding it, but it was still true then, according to Bolzano. But Brentano is the really interesting figure uh, who launched Austrian philosophy. And incidentally, Ortega y Gasset, this great Spanish philosopher, says that Brentano's generation was the unluckiest generation in the history of modern European philosophy. The reason being that they came of age at a time when the experimental sciences were the closest to wiping out philosophy, to marginalizing it. And so there's something heroic, in a way, about the way Brentano tried to launch a new kind of philosophy, and he had the, the masterful personality and temperament to push that through. Um, he was a, a very powerful and, and, in some ways, intimidating teacher who happened to attract very good students, and his students were one of the most important in the last 150 years of European philosophy. His main idea was that he brought back uh, a medieval notion known as intentionality, which is that any mental act has an object. To perceive is to perceive something. To judge is to judge something. To feel an emotion is to feel an emotion about something. Now, it's sometimes mistakenly believed that Brentano thinks that's about objects outside the mind, but that's not true. I mean, Brentano's talking completely about objects inside the mind. He calls it intentional inexistence. Bertano thinks that the existence of the outside world is, is never really provable. It's probably there, but you can't really prove it. So for him, it's still some kind of psychology. I think it's, it's a little deeper than that, but every mental act has an object. And there are three kinds. There's presentations, there's judgments, and there's valuations. And um, objects are just inside the mind. Right, so, um, now here's the thing, though. Bertano is still very dependent on the British empiricist tradition, which he greatly admired, by the way. What he, he didn't admire so much was Kant and Hegel. He was a great fan of Aristotle and also the British empiricists. And like the British empiricists, he also believes that these objects in the mind are bundles of qualities. There's nothing about them different from a bundle of, of properties. Just so again, the apple would be red, sweet, spherical, cold, juicy, hard, all of that uh, joined together in some way. But there's no unifying principle in that apple. It's, it's a bundle of qualities put together. And in his later philosophy, which is often seen as a very extreme break with his earlier philosophy, he simply pushes this to the ultimate extreme. What he says there, for example, is that um, 
Socrates sitting and Socrates standing are not actually the same thing. Right? It, it, um, they call this reason. It, uh, when you have a substance with its accidents, that entire thing is the thing. So as I, as I change physical positions, I'm becoming a new person. Because he thinks that a thing is individuated by its exact space, place in space and time. And if you change your place in space and time, uh, you become actually a different thing, even in a similar one. And this happened entirely because I think he went too far and identified a thing with the total number of all its qualities. And here's something I'll just mention briefly. Art van Arenfels, who invented the idea of gestalt, that you're not just seeing points of color, but you're seeing shape, uh, unified shapes. He's another of Brentano's students. He's also mentioned in Kafka's diaries, so he's an interesting figure in Prague in Kafka's time. Okay, now, now, this is a little more central to what I'm interested in. Tordowski, a younger student of Brentano in Vienna. Uh, Vienna Brentano was uh, not allowed to officially teach, though, by the way, because he, he was kind of defrocked priest. He, he contested papal infallibility when it was announced, and shortly thereafter he was married. He ended up leaving the priesthood and the church entirely. Uh, so he wasn't able to officially teach because he had been slotted for a Catholic professorship, and so he was able only to act as a kind of unofficial advisor. And so all these students that come now had, did not have Brentano as their actual advisors, but they had him as a teacher. And here's what Trudowski says. Trudowski says that Brentano is wrong to talk only about things inside the mind, because you also have to point outside the mind, otherwise it's not knowledge. And so he makes a distinction. There's op there an object outside the mind and there's a content inside the mind. Object and content, that's what his philosophy is about. His major book is called On the Object and Content of Presentations. And this is very important because this is really what inspired rivalry and Husserl. Oh, God, I'm going to skip my little Husserl here in a second. Um, Husserl didn't like this theory of Tordowski's because this would mean that if you talk about Berlin, that's a Berlin inside the mind, and then what's the relation of that Berlin to the Berlin outside the mind? Husserl thought it was foolish to double like this. The thing you talk about is the same as the real thing, according to Husserl. My argument, however, is that Husserl keeps Twardowski's distinction between content and object. He simply doesn't, he, he implodes it into the mind itself. Um, I can explain that more clearly. For Husserl, even within perception, there's a difference between, difference between object and content, and this is the key to Husserl's whole philosophy, Husserl, the founder of phenomenology. For Husserl, an apple is not a bundle of qualities. An apple is a unified thing. How do you know this? Well, because you can spin the apple in your hand, and you'll be seeing different qualities at different times, right? But it remains the same apple. The apple is not defined by all of its exact configurations of properties, because those can change constantly, and yet we don't tell ourselves that that's a different apple. We keep thinking of it as the same apple in each instance. And in fact, uh, what, what is a phenomenological analysis like when Husserl does one? Husserl takes an object such as a mailbox or a tree or imaginary ones like a battle of centaurs, and tries to vary all the possible appearances this thing could have and focus on what's really essential. You know, if you imagine yourself looking at the tree from different angles and distances and different moods, different times of day, uh, what is it that remains the same? What is essential to that tree in your mind? That's how you determine the essence, as he calls it. Okay, so that's a kind of object, but it's not a real object. Husserl doesn't see this because Husserl doesn't see the sense of talking about a real world outside of consciousness. Husserl becomes more and more of an idealist as his career goes forward. But the tools that I talk about in Heidegger, the hammer that withdraws from all access, or the chair that you, the, is deeper than any relation, that's not something that exists in Husserl's philosophy. In Husserl's philosophy, objects are things that are, always, that are already there in our consciousness as soon as we recognize them. Um, it's sometimes wrongly believed that Husserl thinks the apple is hiding behind all of its qualities. That's Heidegger, that's not Husserl. Heidegger is the one who believes in hidden objects. For Husserl, the apple is there as soon as I recognize it as an apple. It's just that it has this surplus of overly specific qualities as well, pasted on top of that apple. I can, I can rotate the apple, I can move it to different distances, I can shine lights off of it, and um, it's still the same apple. It's just that there are additional qualities pasted on top of it. So, what is the difference between these Austrian theories of objects and, and the inherent the title, American Objects versus Austrian Objects? What's the difference between these various Austrian theories of objects and the kind that I and my friends have recommend here? First of all, there are two kinds, at least in my version of the theory. I don't think in you guys necessarily. Uh, there's, the, um, there's the real object that hides from all contacts. There's the real object that can never be touched by anything. 
And then there's what I call essential logic, rather than the intentional logic. Just because intentional logic is such a boring title, boring term, I wanted something a little flashier. Uh, essential logic is the, the one that exists in our experience. Those don't hide from us at all. I'm looking around, I'm seeing chairs, people, and so forth. But those are not the same as the real chairs and people. They're hidden from all experience. That's one difference. The other difference is that the Austrians, when they talk about the difference between the object outside and the content inside, that's something for humans and maybe for animals. Right? That's something. That's a difference that exists for thinking creatures. That there are real objects outside of us, and somehow the real objects are presented differently from how they really are. Whereas for me, this exists even at the animal level. That objects are doing this to each other. The really strange part of my philosophy that uh, uh, just as things hide from humans, things hide from each other as well. You don't find that in the Austrian theories. And the other difference is that I have a fourfold structure like Heidegger, not a twofold structure like the Austrians. For the Austrians, it's always a matter of object and content. Whereas for me, there's two differences in the world. First of all, there's the difference between reality and the way it appears to us. And second of all, and that's Heidegger. And second of all, there's the, the difference we find in Husserl, which is the difference between the unified apple and all the different ways it can be perceived, all the different ways it can appear to us at different times. And let's go back to Heidegger. Uh, we've already talked about this, but just to remind you, Heidegger does not agree that things are as they appear to us. Things are what high from appearances. And then there's Whitehead, who is a number of my heroes for the reason that Whitehead goes back to the four counter revolution. Frankly, he says that uh, uh, we can go back to 17th century philosophy that the relations between any two things is on the same footing as the relation between human and the world. What I don't like about Whitehead is the fact that in my reading, at least, not Stevens, uh, Whitehead turns a thing into its relations. Uh, he says that analyze a thing, what a thing is, you analyze its prehensions. Prehensions can be thought of as relations. All the relations it has with other things in the universe, that's what a thing is. And these, this, this thing, which is a kind of cluster of prehensions or relations, keeps perishing. So it's kind of a occasionalist theory of time. That one moment disappears and is replaced by another moment that's similar. And that moment disappears and is replaced by another moment that's similar, and so on. But I still like the fact that he puts all relations on the same footing, unlike Kant, who put the human world relation on top of all others. Zabiri, so another of my object oriented heroes, a few people read, Spanish Basque philosopher, who says that the essence of a thing must be completely non relational, which is very unfashionable right now in Jungian philosophy. Everyone's talking about relations. Zabiri so is the one that says, um, the essence of a thing cannot be the effect it has on other things. The essence of a thing has to belong to it alone, and it's own rights. Uh, and this is what first made me start thinking about hidden objects, deeper than their effect on anything else. The problem with Zubiri is that he's too restrictive about what can have an essence. For example, he says that a knife or a farm cannot have an essence, they're not real. Why? Because a knife or a farm are their effects on other things. A knife is its ability to cut other things. A farm is its ability to be farmed or visited or grazed by animals. Uh, so what, what is a real thing for Zabiri? In the end, it's kind of disappointing. He says the thing is a atomic cortical structure. So it sounds like a physical structure in the end, which is actually disappoint disappointing realism, I call it, rather than naive realism. Uh, but he did a lot of work with that concept of essence. Levinas, who I also took a lot from in a number of ways, but one of them is that he thinks that Heidegger is too quick to put all tools together in a system. Heidegger does say that a hammer only gains its meaning from the total system of construction work in which it's used, or a you know, knife only gains its meaning from whether it's being used by a butcher or a murderer or a cook. Um, whereas Levinas says that no, a thing can be moved in and out of different systems of relations, and so therefore a thing must be a substance. The, the classical theory of substance is right, according to Levinas. McLuhan who might be a figure of more interest to some people in a department like Ian's. Um, McLuhan, of course, is a media theorist, and you see his centennial is coming out next year. There are going to be a number of events you might want to participate in around the world for its 100th birthday. McLuhan's known as a media theorist, but we're wrong if we think of media too quickly as radio or television or the internet. All human made artifacts are, are media for, the McLuhan, for McLuhan, and I'd push it even further. I'd be willing to read it so that you can. Use his law, his media laws, to analyze even inanimate objects such as stones that are not human created. And one of McLuhan's most interesting works is his book Laws of Media, which he lived to finish, his son Eric had to finish it for him. And that is 
is about a concept called the tetrad, which is that every all media have a fourfold structure. All media do four things. They enhance something, they make something obsolescent, they uh, overheat and reverse into their opposites, and also all media retrieve an older medium as their content. So that, for example, uh, email retrieves paper mail as its content. Bruno Latour, okay. You can read my book, Prints and Networks, if you want to know what I think about Latour. What was important to me about Latour is, first of all, that I needed a, I needed a change of tone after so many years of Heidegger. Heidegger is very gloomy and ponderous and bit pompous and pedantic and dark. Latour, by contrast, is witty, has real dancing feet as a stylist, he's a little sarcastic and funny at times. But Latour was also talking about individual objects, which Heidegger at times views with contempt. There's a great passage in Latour where he says, here too the gods are present in Adidas shoes as well as in wooden peasant shoes carved up by hand. It's an obvious slap at Heidegger. Uh, because for Latour, any object, can, and it's an actor, and all actors can be discussed by philosophy. There's not this romanticism of peasant handicraft as opposed to modern technology. Now, uh, in my book, I said there are four main concepts in Latour's early work. One is that all things are actors. And again, whether it be what the four things you mentioned, Adams, I forgot your list. Yeah, alpacas. Uh, Adams, alpacas. Bits and bleedings. Bits and bleedings, yeah. But the Latour, these are all actors, as are concepts, as are unicorns, as is Popeye, as are blocks of cement, as are army tanks, and so on. Anything is an actor for Latour. Uh, what makes an actor real for Latour is that it has an effect on something else. That's how you know a thing is real. Thing is real when it has an effect on something else. Things are whatever they transform, modify, perturb, or create, Latour says. Um, another of his main concept is translation. A thing happens in one time and one place only, and you can't assume it's the same if you move it to another place. So this is another occasionalist idea, right? The, the, the eye who is standing here and the eye of tomorrow at 12 o'clock noon, you can't automatically say we're the same person. There's no concept of substance, enduring substance in Latour's philosophy. Things change, and you have to, it's your job to show that there's an equivalent between those two things, and it takes hard work to do that. And finally, alliances for the tour. Uh, things are their alliances. Things are the effects they have on other things, and the more alliances a thing has, the stronger it becomes, the more isolated a thing becomes, the weaker it is. And this is a very good method in the social sciences, in anthropology, and sociology, and geography, and all, the, all these fields that love the tour and use them abundantly. He's still not very widely read in philosophy. I hope my book changes that. Um, one of the problems with this theory, I think, is that it does an injustice to objects that might not currently have an effect on other things. And one example is the, the undiscovered genius. It's one of my favorite examples, because for the tour, there's no such thing as the undiscovered genius. And Pasteur, for example, he wrote a whole book on Louis Pasteur. Pasteur succeeds only because he's able to enlist a whole list, a whole number of allies in defense of his theories. First it's the hygienists, and later, later it's the doctors. He even says that the germs are allies in a sense, because he, he has to convince them to behave a certain way by designing an experiment a certain way. Um, so a, a failed pasteur for the tour would be equivalent to a, a pasteur with no talent whatsoever. And I think that's problematic. I think it's problematic to say that all failures are equal. I don't think all failures are equal. I think there are worthy and unworthy failures. Um, just as I think that there are objects that can exist without having an effect on anything else. Now, as far as occasionalism, I would say Latour is also an occasionalist because he also thinks two things cannot touch directly, they need a mediator. Two things need a mediator. An example he gives is that the, in the French government before World War II, uh, Frédéric Joliot, the scientist, uh, had to convince the French government that politics had neutrons were linked. Until he came, about, came around, there was no link between politics and neutrons. And now, now it goes without saying. We're, we're used to having nuclear weapons policy and foreign government policy. But um, Latour, so Latour is an occasionalist, but he, he's not calling on God. Even though actually Latour is a, a religious Catholic, he does not call on God in this part of his philosophy at all. He says that there is always a third local thing that mediates between two other things. In this case, it's Frederick Julio who, medi who mediates between politics and neutrons. Now, the criticism I made of this in my book is that if politics cannot touch neutrons, then why can Joliot touch either politics or neutrons? There should be an infinite regress, right? There's always a third term between any two things to touch. That would go on forever. You'd never be able to get to the door, as in Zeno's paradoxes. Right? You have to go halfway, and then you have to go halfway, and then halfway, and halfway. You keep getting closer and closer to the door, but you never arrive. 
And so what this led me to see is that there has to be some form of contact that is direct and not mediate. Get back to Heidegger's fourfolds. And I'm going to just leave this up for one second because I'm going to show you my own diagram instead. And I have to get out of PowerPoint and go on to uh, Adobe to show you this. Can you read those terms? Can you make it a bit bigger? Yes. How about that? I don't want to. These are terms taken from my forthcoming book, The Quarter of Objects. Tell you what these four things are. This is my fourfold, not Heidegger's, but I think Heidegger's is saying the same thing. That you have two kinds of objects. Those are the, the shaded circles, right? You have the real object, and then the, the object inside experience, which is the shaded circle on the bottom. And then the white ones on the right are the qualities belonging to the object. And this is a diagram of Husserl's philosophy. You will see that the real object does not exist in Husserl's philosophy. That's why there's no line connected there. It's, it's absent in his philosophy. What Husserl's philosophy is mainly about is that lower level, where you have what I call the unified central tree, and you have the various shifting central profiles of the central tree. Well, that might sound funny, but all it means is that you can rotate it around a tree from different angles and distances and look at it, and it's still the same tree, even though you're, it's a different sense experience each time. Right? Um, but there's a, a second thing in Husserl that does exist, which is that there are certain important features of the tree that have to be there. Right? There are certain features the tree cannot lose and still be that same tree. And so they're not all accidental and shifting. There are some that are there. They're part of the core of the tree. And that's what he calls the eidos, using the Greek word for essence. Those things cannot be experienced with your senses. They have to be experienced category categorically, using your minds. Those are something hidden. They're withdrawn from all human central access. But they're there, because otherwise the thing wouldn't be what it is. And now we'll go to this. Oh, I should mark. Here's one that's Heidegger and Leibniz, because what Heidegger does not have is Heidegger does not have unified objects in the world of the senses. Heidegger is more like Twardowski, right? Heidegger believes that there are tools outside of experience, and then inside of experience there are qualities. Whereas for Husserl, you have individual chunks in sense experience that have shifting features every second. Uh, for Heidegger, you don't. The objects are outside of experience for Heidegger. And then I, so he, Heidegger's that diagonal line, and then the horizontal line is Leibniz, because Heidegger doesn't talk about this. But for Leibniz, uh, monads are not just one, they also have many qualities. Right? Even outside of experience, the monad has to have many qualities. Why? Because if a monad was only one, all monads would be the same. My soul will be the same as your soul, the same as a horse's soul, the same as a tree. So there have to be different qualities, and so there's a tension there in the real things. So you put those, put those two together, and you get Heidegger's fourfolds. And some people think it's a little far-fetched, but I think if you go back to Heidegger's career from 1919 onward, you can see that this is what he means. His, his early attack on those stories shows that this is what he means. So you see what you've got. You've got the real object, and with its real qualities, that's outside experience on the top row. And the bottom, you have the sensual object with its sensual qualities, and those are the things we see, like horses and apples and trees that are shifting properties every moment in our experience. And he draws diagonal lines between them, and you've got Heidegger's fourfolds. And this is what I was trying to piece together in my the book I wrote last summer. Well, I didn't mean to make it larger, I meant to move. What you really have, though, are ten possible links. And I know it sounds very baroque and noisy to have ten different possible kinds of relations. But you'll see that four doesn't exhaust it, right? There are all these possible different ways of linking the four poles of reality. Ten in all. You can link each pole of reality with the other three, plus link it with itself. And you get ten. And I also think there are ways in which the links break. And I'll just talk about two of the simplest ones here. Theory is an example. Normally, you have something like a, a tree in experience, and for Husserl, it has these properties that are essential to it, for it to be a tree. They cannot change and still have to be a tree. But you don't think about that consciously. The two are bound together in some unconscious way. You experience the tree, and there are certain real properties that it must have that are essential, but you don't bother analyzing those. What does it mean when you analyze those? That's what, that's what theory is all about. That's what intellectual life is. You're, you're trying to analyze what are the important features of a thing. That's the diagonal line going from lower left to upper right. The other one I talked about a lot in my book, Guerrilla Metaphysics, is the lure. That's the one that goes from upper left to lower right. And that is what I think happens in artworks and in many other cases of human experience, where a thing becomes separate from its qualities 
uh, in a way that they seem to become detached from one another. And the real object just becomes this vague thing that you know is there, but you can't quite define it. This is why I think it happens in our works. And you can see, I think, even, even causation involves this. Causation involves breaking the link between a real object and its real qualities. Just a few more here. I give them playing card notations here so that people would have an easier time remembering that the black ones are objects and the red ones are its qualities. What I, this is my, my most important breakthrough of three years ago, I think, was realizing that this fourfold structure actually explains where our concepts of space and time come from, and also that space and time are not alone, that there are two other things with space and time. And to explain what I mean, what do we really mean when we talk about the experience of time? If we forget what physics says about it, what we mean about the experience of time is time is passing, the appearance of things is changing, and yet many of those things seem to remain the same things, right? even though their, their surface qualities are changing. That's what, we, that's what we mean by the passage of time. It means change, uh, change within similarity. It means some things are remaining there as anchors in our experience. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm walking, I'm moving, I'm seeing different sides of you as I move, but I know you're still the same person. That's what we mean by time. Space, likewise, is... There's a big debate between Newton and Leibniz over what space is. Is space relational, or is it something... Is space an absolute objective grid that things move around in, or is it simply a byproduct of the relations between individual things? I say it's neither. I say that space is the place of both relation and non-relation. And that's, I think it's pretty commonsensical. That space is the place of relation because I'm a certain distance from everything that exists. And space is also the place of non-relation because I don't touch everything. I have to do some actual work to come into contact with Hong Kong or the North Pole right now. It'll take me a while to get there. And so space is both relation and non-relation. And that's that line going diagonally upper left to lower right. And then, actually, ever since I was a child, I always wondered, why do people always talk about space and time? Why are space and time? Isn't there anything that goes with those two? Why are space and time unique when people philosophize? And I realized that they're not unique. They go along with these other two terms, essence and adults. Because what are space and time about? In my interpretation, they're about the tension between objects and qualities. But it only takes care of two of the four permutations. There are two other kinds of tension between an object and its qualities. One is that real objects are unified, but they also have a multitude of features. And that's what we mean by essence, right? The thing is one, but the thing has many qualities that are essential to it, that's essence. And it also, again, that's Husserl's term for when you have one object in experience that's unified, but it has many real features that are hidden from us. You know, the tree that's in experience has many essential qualities outside of us that it needs in order to be what it is. And so time, space, essence, and ados are the four things that I call tensions. But that's only four of the 10. Uh, and I've, I need to put up another slide here, actually. Because I have a name for what, what it is when you analyze these 10, and that is ontography, which is not a name for my whole philosophy, but I'll explain the slide in a second. Some of you might recognize it. I was looking for a special term to describe how to analyze these 10 separate relations that exist between the four poles of the object, and I happened to be reading M.R. James' ghost stories last summer while I was at a wedding in England, and this, this is a film version of that creepy story, he'll whistle and I'll come to you, my lad. And this, this professor is called the professor of ontography in the story. It's a, very, it's a funny joke. The field doesn't exist. And so I decided to take that joke and adopt it. And the four tensions of the first part of ontography. Uh, what's next? I call these three radiations because these are how one thing has multiple qualities. Right? One real thing can have multiple qualities, one sensual thing can have multiple qualities, and one one thing can have both real and central qualities simultaneously. I call these contraction, duplicity, and emanation. I'm not going to explain them. You have to read the book to understand. It's coming out in French and English simultaneously this summer. And the three, uh, where you have real objects relating to real, real relating to sensual, and sensual relating to itself, I call those junctions. All of that will be explained in the book. I think I'm running out of time. Yeah, so I got to, yeah. I'm going to close off here. One slide. Is that on Georgia Tech campus? Yeah. Yeah, okay. What is object oriented ontology useful for? Some people have said, is it just going to turn into a dry and very subtle and refined form of metaphysics? Well, in a way, yes, but that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Philosophy has made a lot of progress by doing that in the past. But there's also already been a lot of interest in this from many different fields. I receive email constantly from archaeologists, from the various studies people, from people in computers, and so on. What is it that interests people about this? Well, I think, one thing that interests people is that we've gotten too far away from material reality. Okay. 
Another virtue of this position is that it allows us to talk about inanimate interactions and human world interactions in the same way, which philosophy has not been able to do for a very long time. Another thing I think, though, is that it is something that allows us to not become too trapped in any given method. And this is going to be my final comment of the talk. In a way, I think that any intellectual method is an exaggeration. Right? You, you, you create a method for something that's a way of creating a useful exaggeration. The Taurus philosophy is a good example because the Taurus as a thing is nothing more than what it affects, what its effects are. The thing is what, what effects it has on other things. I think that's a very useful method. I simply think it's an exaggeration. Because I think the thing is always deeper than those effects. But it is a very useful way of cutting through hypocrisies and uh, trying to gain some definite sense of what a thing really is. If you, uh, in a university department, say, we're going to give the highest salary to the person with the most quantity of publications. Okay, well that's obviously an exaggeration, and that it bad effects in individual cases, but it's, it can be a powerful method. It can be a way of cutting through the pretenses people have and just assigning the salaries and something looking like an objective factor. And any method you can think of for, over, for, for simplifying some subject matter is an exaggeration. And in a way, what this philosophy of object does is it serves as a kind of counter method. It serves as a way of saying that there is something outside any method. There's something deeper, some residue that can never be conceptualized by any method if you bring to bear on anything. And in this way, it, it gives us the chance to come in contact with reality that is deeper than our conceptualization of it in any case. And I think I'll stop there because I've gone a little bit over. And I will take questions now. Yeah, so um, we're going to try this sort of cage match experiment. Um, what, what, uh, what we set up was that uh, uh, Hugh Crawford and Carl DeSalvo and uh, John Johnston and Eugene Thacker agreed to be respondents for the symposium, as well as Barbara Stafford, who is welcome either to save up her comments for the end, as we've scheduled, or to join us in the, in the cage at the, at the table. You guys, you guys want to try this? Let's, let's see what happens. Yeah. We're very, very uh, eager and uh, active group of respondents here. So I, th I thought what we do is we'll give them a chance to uh, to beat each other up a little bit. Then we'll take some, some questions. Let me shut this uh, this off so that you're actually maybe that's actually kind of a lovely picture to have in the background. Yeah, it's projecting a new space. And uh, those of you in the wings on the floor might want to find seats this this time if you like. You guys want the mic? Oh, it's not too mild. Okay. Yeah, you guys, it looks like you brought a piece of wood. Hello. <clears throat> well, I took a lot of notes. I'm not quite sure exactly what sorts of provocations to, uh, to, to start with. Uh, so, so let me start with a, with a confession. I think I'm an um, um, unrepentant uh, Latourian Whiteheadian. Uh, so maybe I should be talking with, with, with Stephen, uh, or rather than you with Greg and Lenny Graham. Um, but this is what I was puzzled through all this. Uh, uh, first off, to, to say I'm an unrepentant Latourian Whiteheadian would be to say it's almost a redundancy because I don't really think Latour is Whitehead or something. I mean, there's, 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 a lot to be, there's a lot of work to be done in, in understanding uh, uh, Latour's relation to Whitehead. Uh, but, but really what I'm saying is that is I think of something for relationist, which makes me key in on just a couple of terms. Uh, um, you mentioned prehension, uh, and I keep circling back to, to your opening discussion about object-oriented ontology. Uh, and, and, you know, I understand that, that what that really means is this is an ontology that's oriented towards objects. But the order is fine because it says object-oriented, and it makes me think of objects as they orient, in other words, as they orient to each other. Yes. Because, you know, what, what's, what's in the middle of, of your argument, clearly, is, is this notion of, of objects outside of human consciousness, human mind, uh, that hook one to each other in whatever ways. Uh, and so I, I guess what I'm asking you to talk a little bit about is, is you know, that seems to be the relationist argument, right? In other words, that's very close to prehension. Um, but, but I guess I, I want to hear more about just the choice of the word orient in relation to objects. You, you see what I'm driving towards here? Yes, although the original decision was purely an accidental. Uh, no, no, I, I, I mean, hearing, hearing, hearing your description, it made me think about that. But at the same time, there is, you know, the, you know it invites this note. How do objects orient, and is that uh, valuable philosophical practice, coming to an understanding of that? How do objects orient to one another? Yes. Without being as conscious as humans are? Yeah. 
or you know, I guess what I'm really inviting you to do is talk about your, your conscious objects. Right. There's obviously a lot of resistance to that, although panpsychism is coming back into fashion. The idea that everything has a soul. There's this nice set of writings by David Scribina. Panpsychism in the West is a long history he wrote of the, showing that it's been a respectable position throughout the history of Western philosophy. Even though it seems marginal and crazy, it's actually been said by all kinds of people, even ones you wouldn't expect. You know, rocks have a soul of yeah, thinking and things like that. How do you conceptualize the way in which inanimate things think, knowing that they don't have perception, they don't have dreaming, they don't have logical thinking capacities? You have to imagine some kind of really primitive form of awareness, and it's very difficult for us to do that. I propose this term speculative psychology, which would be trying to figure out all these, how, how does this think, or how does this tape think? And it's very hard to make any progress in that. You just have to think at a very primitive level. A lot of people have accused me of, of uh, retroactively projecting human mental traits back into an animate matter. I don't think that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to say there's a deeper, more fundamental thing that causal interactions and human perception both have to rise out of. Now, obviously, objects aren't going to have quite as much cognitive power at their disposal to do this. They're going to have very limited freedom, if any. They're going to have very limited insight, if any. But uh, I think we have to be looking at some primitive layer of the cosmos that is there in an animate interaction as well as in cognitive human ones. I'm not sure I can go here. Activity. What this means is things don't have an essential nature and they become what they are. They come for those guys. I mean, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, that forces across the universe. Yeah. Um, you, you find in Babylonian love spells, ties that bind. I mean, all of this goes back to Plato ultimately, but it's what is the leader, uh, what Peter would call the Neoplatonists in the cave, uh, the late guys, uh, developed um, and really placing. Uh, an emphasis um, on, uh, I would say, the theological component. It's kind of thaumaturgy. Uh, uh, but, um, but where the object, and it relates also to a theory of aesthetics, uh, you know, the art object, uh, as a serious maker of impact, as performance that you can't simply reduce uh, to, to um, I mean, it's about the making of relationships, but the potency is in, within the object. So, sorry, I'm just, just wonderful. Yeah. Let, let me take a different tack. I want to talk about carpentry for a second and, and, and this notion. Of sorry, sorry. Not just, I'm talking about real carpentry here in, in this sense. And, and again, this, this is all sort of driving me. This is actually a 6x6 six six beam that was hewed by hand, uh, which means that it was cut with a broad axe. Uh, and, and it's been the, my way of trying to think through the, this, this notion of object prehension orientation and everything else. Uh, in the sense that, you know, a broad axe is an interesting tool because it's only sharpened on one side, which consequently 
enables you to cut nice, smooth edges. Uh, so, so here's an object that actually prehends the world in a very specific way. Uh, and, it, and it produces very specific sets of orientations. And the wood, of course, pushes back as well. Latour kind of famously said at some point that the real is that which pushes back. Yeah. Uh, and then, to me, that's an interesting kind of realism because, because it enables you to start thinking about how objects push back. And again, it's a relationist position. I can understand that. Uh, um, but, but you know, the wood only splits in a certain way. When you hit a knot, it goes in a different direction. The broad axe only cuts in one direction. Uh, and all of those are forms of orientation that are, that are, that are, are properties of the object. Maybe not the object itself, but, but, see, but, but it's, it's actually a way to get to them, it seems to me. Uh, in the absence, of course, there's human volition here in the sense that somebody is swinging the axe, but, but it's a lot more complex there than that. I like the idea of resistance as long as it's not just resistance to humans again, as long as the yeah. can resist each other as well. Well, that's it. I mean, the axe and the, you know, you see, yeah. Because even, for example, in Fichte, there's this resistance, right? So there's some kind of minimal reality there in the German idealists, but it's not very developed because the, the parts of the world don't relate to each other. And even Latour has been treated two ways on this topic. Some people think that Latour isn't really a realist because there's always a human there and his accounts right, looking at things. I tend to see that as an artifact of the fact that Latour talks about scientific situations most of the time. By definition, there's a human involved in any scientific situation. But there, there are other passages in Latour's early work where he says, for example, that things interpret each other just as humans interpret things. Uh, and for me, that's enough to give him some credit for being a, a true realist. It's so good. So, I have a question that, well, taking Ian's challenge, may, may not be provocational, it may just be naive, um, but I actually think it fits for the context that we're in. So, and then and it's about OO generally, and maybe less for you individually to have a discussion around, which is um, there's a sense in which when it's when we when we hear object oriented being talked about. I often ask the question, so to what extent is this really uh, trying to do in philosophy what we already do in engineering? And I think that that's an interesting question to ask within the context of an engineering institute. And I'm reminded of the story that Latour once told about trying to explain actor network theory to a group of roboticists who said, well, right, right, so what? Like that's exactly like the notion that all of these things are actors and the notion that objects um, have resistances amongst each other of which we need to be no part is, is not at all, this is, this is not at all an issue, for example, in engineering research. So the question is, is that in what ways are, this is sort of a, a philosophical position to look at things that are already happening and may already have been happening in science and technology. I think in one sense they can serve as inspiration, and Latour has been one of the best people at doing that and reading these kinds of metaphors. And my favorite passage in all of Latour, I think, is when he says that instead of a correspondence model of truth or a coherence model of truth, he wants the industrial model of truth. Whereas, how does a crude oil from Saudi Arabia get into a gas tank in Paris? You have to go through all the steps. And truth works like that, too. He also says, doesn't he, that metaphysics is a branch of public works, a uh, branch of public infrastructure. I think I would agree with that, too. And he has this tendency to put all relations on the same level. Then he kind of contradicts himself by saying all philosophers have to be empirical. Because first he says that everything's empirical, and then he says, wait, where are your field studies? You're not doing any field studies in your book, then you're... I would answer that the kind of work I do does not involve field studies. It involves putting concepts together, but it's kind of engineering. Yeah, in some sense it is already happening. In some sense it's not, though. Why can I not just go read an engineering book and be satisfied and stop doing metaphysics? It's because this idea of withdrawn objects, right, that you're not going to ever get that in engineering. You're going to get very specific objects that have specific properties that are located in space time and have certain specifications, you need to be able to do certain things, uh, whereas the objects I'm talking about are a layer deeper than that. Now, I, I wouldn't, I also don't want to say that philosophy is the ground for all other things, any, any more than when people say science is the ground for everything play except that. I just think philosophy deals with a different range of objects than engineering does, but otherwise I think they're of the same kind. I don't separate right things in philosophy and the applied arts. Actually, maybe I can uh, drop again a Carl and uh, Hugh's point on because the part I was really fascinated by was the sort of negative the propensity for withdrawing uh, an objects. And I was, the part I still don't get, partially because this is beaten into my head as an underground thing, is the Kantian thing. Um, I'm still struggling with, with how the thing in itself, even if it just serves a logical function as the thing that has to be there that you can have your access, is how we're sort of looking beyond that. But instead of 
Robert E. Kahn. I, just, I thought of another example which comes from the uh, 15th century Chinese philosopher uh, Wang Yang Ming, who's a Neo Confucianist philosopher. And there's a story that they always tell about it where his master told him that true philosophy is the investigation of things. Mm -hmm. And so his teacher told him about investigating things, and he went with a couple of his friends, and they went out, and they sat in front of a bamboo plant or something. And, and like a week or something, they sat in front of a very <coughs> investigating the, they're trying to find the principle of we, which is the essence of the principle of the bamboo plant, and after like a week or two weeks, I don't know what it was, they, nothing happened, and they got sick, and then they just decided to call the whole thing off, and they came back, and then like a week later, when he has this realization that it wasn't that the object made them sick, was the thing, but that the object withdrew, and it was empty. And that he could only realize that if his mind was also empty. So not that his mind is a thing like a brain, but that somehow making his mind into a thing in some sort of way and bypassing that, that sort of correlation thing. So you know, I guess the, the again the question for me is is again is is Kant there as sort of a straw man or is there really a way to not so much a straw man as both an enemy and a hero, because uh, as came out of my discussion with Stephen, there is one aspect, one way in which I'm very close to this, <coughs> just this idea of things in themselves. There's something deeper, <coughs> always in how things manifest themselves. The way in which he is an enemy, of course, is the idea that it's the human world relations that we talked about. You can't say anything about relations between parts of things in themselves. You can't even say if there is more than one thing in itself. It could be a lump. He says, you can't even be sure about that, because quantity is a human category. Um, so Kant is both is there both as a great hero and a great villain. Um, and I couldn't figure out what your orientation was, whether you approve of the thing in itself or whether you want to get past it. Well, it seems to me that what you're inviting by speaking about objects withdrawing mm -hmm. invites basically a, a negative on or maybe a neon or something like that. And and that 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 would then maybe invite us to think about objects as inherently maybe paradoxical in some way. I think they are paradoxical. But I don't think it's just a negative theology where all you can say is what it's not. So uh, you, you can talk about certain features as you can never perceive it by definition. You can still analyze certain features that the real object has, how it might come into causal relations with other things. So it's not a lost cause. Well, so that's what I know. Okay, because, I mean, uh, how, how do we escape that triangulation where we're claiming that, say, uh, objects have or do not have relations with? Where we're claiming that. Well, like somebody was, a student joked to me that like, I won't start reading object oriented ontology unless uh, uh, there's a book written by a block of wood. And I said, well, that's funny, but you know, you would just spend recuperate the block of wood into this author function and so on. So, but I think the, the point the student was making is that, you know, some of the philosopher is still claiming that, you know, objects do that. And I was like, okay, that's sort of a critique you come up with any sort of metaphysical claim, but it seemed the more interesting thing in, embedded in that was something about an assertion of a, a negative presence or something like that that would go beyond simply um, linguistic, kind of mystical theology, maybe and stuff, but that, that there's a negative, um, I, I don't know what to say, there's a negative essence to objects or something like that. And maybe the occasional stuff, and also the new famous things that Barbara mentioned might be a way. They're, they're like agnostic objects or something like that. Agnostic objects. I'm trying to think of the proper answer to your student, too. Uh, is that really any different from saying I won't trust a book on Greek philosophy unless it's written by a Greek? Um, okay. you, can build, you can account for that in the standpoint by just saying, yes, but even the, even my version of object oriented ontology is itself conditioned on that perception. But, but Heidegger already accounts for this by saying philosophy is historical, philosophy is not occurring in a vacuum, and it's not an absolute theoretical knowledge, but it's somehow grounded in a context. There's always a certain limitations. That's how I would approach it. That uh, an object has to be object oriented. In other words, you don't have to be an object to talk about objects. I think th th there's a similar problem with this and all this talk about Orientalism, right? It's what say it's saying, how can Westerners talk about the Orient? Which, okay, there may be something to that, and you do see awful Orientalist texts in certain examples, but it's not really that impossible to understand how to be. You encounter people, they surprise you, they shock you, they make you adjust your conceptions of things. 
we do have some access to the real, but as other people, other cultures, or other entities, I believe it's not adequate. But neither is our self-understanding adequate. Do I really understand the United States or myself any better than I understand Egypt? I'm, I'm not so sure. Graham, can I uh, take that one? Uh, you know, I, I, I think one of the points here would also be that uh, you know we we do relate to objects at the central level, uh, what what Graham calls uh, central objects here, and that's that's unavoidable. And uh, you know, the one of the issues here is is how do we provoke those central qualities in our interaction with them? And I think one big difference here between Kantianism and uh, what uh, object-oriented ontology is proposing is uh, that for Kant, the, the object, the thing in itself, is this poor, pathetic little thing. It's over-determined completely uh, by the concepts, by the forms of space and time. It contributes no differences of, uh, of its own. And I think this, this negative moment of the withdrawn object, as it relates to the sensuous qualities, always contains this moment of being able to surprise those human relations in a variety of ways. So, you know, I, I don't know if Graham would uh, disagree with me here on this point, uh, but while the real object is completely withdrawn from all relation, this does not prevent us from talking about all sorts of what uh, I believe you uh, recently called foreign relations yeah. uh, among sensual objects, and uh, we are going to be deeply interested in, uh, in this. And I, I think one of the bad habits that object-oriented ontology might move us away from a bit, uh, which came out very nicely in uh, Graham's little Chinese proverb, is this constant moment of self-reflexivity, where the object, the surprising central object, is completely absented, and we're narcissistically looking at ourselves in the mirror, being the fool, looking at the finger that's pointing, rather than the surprising differences that emerge in aleatory and unexpected ways as we engage with these objects. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, I want to. <laughs> <laughs> see, the way I see it, though, uh, you know, towards the end of your talk, Graham, you talked about uh, the sort of anti methodology or uh, uh, the sort of critique of methodology. In my view, uh, and, and I was, uh, you know, prior to my encounter uh, with Graham that took place over a couple of weeks in an intense email exchange, uh, I, I was an unrepentant uh, relationist. Um, and, uh, right, you know, it's, it's this key point, though, of relationality at the central level that is, is able to integrate those different methodological approaches while internally critiquing them and demonstrating uh, their limitations through the preservation of this uh, withdrawn real object. Um. You didn't, uh, you didn't mention Gilles Deleuze, uh, but I know he, he kind of flips in and out of your writings. Um, and you did the, the lengthy review of the, the Delanda book uh, on, uh, on the assemblage. I wanted to ask you about uh, the relationship in Deleuze between the virtual and the actual, um, and how that may or may not be mapped on to your, your full fourfold. Full, you know, how they, how that, those relationships, you know, the objects or that which is actual is, is, is becoming virtual in, in the inverse, the virtual, uh, the virtual uh, the actual the morphogenesis or go back to the, the actual becoming digital, uh, becoming virtual and digital. So, you know, we've got these processes, the two going back and forth, and how would that fit or is there no fit? I mean, would it just, just Yes, and I want to be someone to believe I was one of the great of those commentators these days. That I'll give you my amateurish version of the response. <coughs> the list putting in and out of my writings, yeah, my first encounter was with the list was back in 1990 in Lingus' seminar. And what I really liked was the tone. I, I was at an anti oedipus and I just loved the irreverence of the tone, and I wanted to be like that, and not fall into this scholastic balloon that you so easily otherwise fall into. So I really appreciated that. I never somehow got on board with the philosophy. And I think, for a couple of reasons, virtual actual, I would say, first of all, the virtual is not articulated enough in entities. I mean, any philosopher who uses the virtual, we'll see what Levi does with this concept of the virtual, it'll be a little different. But I'm always worried that, uh, or in Simon Ball, where you have this pre-individual, which is similar, um, it seems to me to be on a slippery slope to the lump. 
And I know Jane Bennett was made a small criticism of me yesterday in her interview on Peter Grattan's blog about that. She thinks I'm too hasty in describing a lump ontology that goes, well, I don't quite do that, but I think it, it is on the slippery slope. I'm worried that how can you say that it's, it's a continuum and yet it's, it's sort of articulated in parts? I think you have to have actual articulated individuals on the hidden level. I don't think anything else works so slightly. Um, the other difference would be, I don't think you get enough horizontal causation in Deleuze. It's more like Neoplatonism, where it goes in one direction, and some people say, yeah, but Deleuze allows the actual to have a retroactive effect on the virtual, if that's even possible. Never really explain how that happens, but what's missing is the actual, actual interactions, as far as I can see. And for me, that's the only place where it happens, because for me, the real things are so deeply hidden they can't touch. And so, just as in Suarez, for whom the causation happens through accidents only, for me, it happens only through the surface level. Causation is a matter of the surface. Things get at each other through their weaknesses and their accidents, not through their essences. So uh, that's another thing I find missing in the Lewis, but I, I still enjoy like reading him so much. It's just one of my most influences for these reasons. I think maybe we should take maybe one or two questions from the floor and then move the conversation into the coffee break, which we can still enjoy for 15 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, as you just mentioned, uh, your, the idea of causation, um, I was wondering, um, so we go back to the uh, fire and cotton, if the fire can't actually ever touch the real cotton, how does something like destruction come about? Okay, so, how, you know, what is, I mean, obviously it turns, you know, Ghazali would say it's, uh, you know, God is making it black and powder, but I mean, how does, you know, how does the process actually work with destruction? The way the destruction has to work is by messing with the arrangement of the pieces of the cotton. So the cotton as a whole will be a unity, and that unity itself is untouchable. But somehow the fire gets at the cotton indirectly by, I don't want to use the word undermine, because I use it for something else, but by, by getting in and, and jumbling the arrangement of the pieces somehow so that the cotton no longer has the pieces it needs to be what it is. And it's a very technical thing to try to explain how this happens, and I can't say that I've done it perfectly yet, but I, I'm trying again in another book that's coming. But that's that's the general idea. So it's like a movement of like so it, since you believe in sort of uh, you know I guess cotton all the way down or something you know yeah, sort of, all the way down. So I mean so the destruction would come about through the sort of the cotton is destroyed because the it's underlining what objects that make it up are rearranged in such a way as to exactly okay yeah so objects are not eternal because they they do have pieces on you know counter alignments objects are not simple. And that's why, that's the reason he thinks they are eternals, because they're simple. And if it's, if it's simple, how can you possibly rearrange the parts? There's no way for anything to happen to it. And I say, no, that it is, things are made of parts. And incidentally, if I can just get in a peripheral remark on Maya Su here, um, Maya Su talks about the absolute contingence of everything, that, you know, that anything could happen, and there's no way to prove otherwise, kind of a hyperhumanism. But I think that position becomes harder to defend if instead of thinking that it's causal relations over time, you think of it as a part whole relationship in a single moment. So, in other words, Maybe it's contingent that this could burst into flame the next moment for no reason, but is it really contingent that this is made of parts it's made of? Could this be made of horse parts or flower parts and still be a microphone? That, I think, is harder to defend. This is exactly about the, the library. You leave the library and you come home and there's a horse and a dung everywhere. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to comment briefly. Uh, it seems like you're trying to get to this idea of perspectivalism, where perspectives all the way down and all of these kind of nested scales. And I was wondering if you correlate this at all with kind of Gapser's thinking on the idea of aperspectivalism and us trying to achieve some understanding of consciousness beyond our own particular perspectives. Because it seems that you're privileging the object over sort of our subjective experience when they're actually co-arising simultaneously. And since we're stuck within our own physiological body and mechanisms and things, that we're, you're, you're struggling for that but it really is this, this perspectivalist approach you're trying to define. Have you written at all about that in terms of Gebser's concepts of, of consciousness and getting to this aperspectival mode? No, not, not specifically, but I, I like what you're talking about. Um, I would not say that the object is generated by a perception of it. I would say that the, the, the sensual version of it is, you know, the, you know, the sensual microphone exists only as far as I perceive it. There has to be something there for me to be able to perceive it. And in other aspects, of my position that I didn't talk about today is that anytime you relate with something else, you're creating a new object, right? That the, the relation between the microphone is a new object. Why? Because um, you can talk about that relation as a unit. You can say, you can analyze my, you know, your relation to the microphone. It becomes a new object with its own new properties. 
Um, but no, I'm not familiar with this position. So that's, that's what I mean by the co-arising aspect of it, that it's not mutually exclusive. Right. That's, what? that's what I mean by the co-arising aspect of it, that it's not mutually exclusive. That it's, it's arising as an object within our consciousness, but then there are the objects actually interacting as well. So that there are multiple perspectives coming from all over the place. And okay. ultimate, like a perspectivalism of it all would be God. <laughs> ah. Like as, as the entire unity within pantheism or panentheism, where they're all contained within all of those perspectives. But it, it does seem like there's this very central aspect of perspectivalism that you're trying to get to, to define, you know, ironically from a, a human-centered perspective what a non-human-centered perspective would look like. My only worry about what you're saying is not like, it sort of sounds like you might be saying that you add up all the possible perspectives on a thing in order to get what the thing is. And the reason that would be the totality of the cosmos, right? Like the cosmos is all of those perspectives combined experiencing itself, which kind of gets to taking the human anthropocentric perspective out of it to acknowledge that all of these other things are going on. Okay, but for example, Merle Ponty again, who's someone who's a beautiful writer who I usually disagree with, says that the, you know, the house is not the house viewed from nowhere, it's the house viewed from everywhere. So you're adding up all the perspectives that all the entities have in the house to get with the houses. And my problem with that is a couple of problems. One of them is it can't handle counter, counterfactual situations. Like what would 15 people who were never born see if they saw this house or some other creature that doesn't exist, happen to exist, what would it see when it sees the house? What it would be seeing is some perspective on the house. It wouldn't be seeing the perspective on the other perspectives. So in other words, there has to be something to the house that's not total about all the other perspectives. And um, the other thing is I don't think you can explain change if you reduce a thing simply to its relational effects. Because, if, for example, if I am nothing more than my relational effects on all other things, why would I ever become anything different in the next moment from what I already am? I'm already deployed in all of these relations. There's nothing in me held in reserve. There's nothing in me that's in excess beyond those relations. So why would I ever change? Am I not already everything I need to be or can be? But I, I, otherwise, I like, I like this model that you're talking about. Yeah. I, think we should, I think we should stop. Right. And uh, let's thank Graham. I think it's a great start.